This episode of the Oh No 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 podcast is sponsored by Dynamic Industrial Services, the rope access specialists. As long-time Wraith Rover supporters, we are very familiar with ropey performances. But if you need a service that's more Sam Stanton than Willie Accio, look no further than DIS. Operating across Scotland, they specialise in working at height, offering maintenance, inspection, repairs and more. So if you've got a problem at a height that even John Fredrickson can't reach, visit dynamicindustrialservices.co.uk to find out more. How would you spend a million pounds? You could hand out five-year deals to all your favourite players. Uh, You could buy 285,714 kebab pies at Starks Park and still have enough left over for a packet of crisps. And uh, even adjusting for inflation, uh, you could break the Rovers' record transfer fee that they paid for Paul Harvey in 1996 uh, twice. Now, what I'd advise that you don't do, though, is spend £1,039,907 to win League One just to get scudded five derbies on the bounce and find yourself in real danger of being bumped right back down again. Welcome back to a jubilant Oh No 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 podcast for one of our regular features, which is talking about the Rovers turning over the townies again. Uh, I am Duncan Cameron, and joining me tonight, I'm very lucky to have uh, Blair Hawcroft, first of all. How are you, Blair? I'm feeling childish. (laughs) Good. I think we all (laughs) might be this evening. Uh, We've also got Leslie Maybon as well. How are you, Les? Absolutely brilliant. Uh, For those of you who are not watching, um, because it's International Women's Day, I've decided to rep the Japanese women's football team. So I'm wearing a Japan Women's World Cup top, which has got the number of Aie Samashima, uh, who used to wear number five. And there's no significance at all to me having that number, other than it just happens to be a number five. (laughs) Excellent. We will take you at your word on that one. Um, We also have John Greer as well, also wearing a very fetching jersey. Uh, How are you, John? I'm very well. I I should have done something for Women's International Women's Day. I could have wore Brenda Gordon Arthur's top. Damn, I got it wrong. (laughs) And uh, and just for a for a limited time only for the uh, the first portion of this episode, I'm uh, delighted to say that we've got the voice of Starks Park with us as well. It's <laughs> uh, it's Christina Beatty. How are you, Christina? I'm very well. I've got just enough voice left to do a bit of the podcast. I nearly lost my voice yesterday. Absolutely, as we uh, as we all heard. So so let's uh, we'll stick with you, Christina. I know you've got to get away. So um, yeah, your first time on the, the PA at Starks Park yesterday and I'd listen, you sounded like a pro uh, to me. Uh, I thought you were brilliant. Nice kind of relaxing afternoon for you in the booth. <laughs> Anything but relaxed. Um, so when I got asked to do this, it was Carol that asked me to do it. There was a, just a home game. I think it was like two days after she asked me. So I'd gone up to speak to Jim beforehand. And um, it was one of those when you say yeah to something and you go, you just think about getting to announce a Sam Stanton goal in your head and how amazing it would be. You don't actually consider what is involved. And then I got full-blown imposter syndrome on Saturday morning. After I'd spoken to Jim the first time, you get a sense of really what, what's involved. And I can't believe that Jim does it on his own, to be honest. It's definitely a two-person job. Um, yesterday, Jim, basically, he did all the technical side of it and literally just told me when to speak and what to say. And he did all the time ins and I just spoke into the microphone. So he normally on a match day would be music, microphone. He's got so much to think about. Like, I just don't know how he does it on his own. Um, 
so because I had had all this like chat with him beforehand, I'd like I really want to do Jim Proud here because I feel like he's done this so well for so long. I don't want to come in and just make it horrible for him to stand beside someone all afternoon and be like, what is going on here? And then obviously representing women, I want to do the women proud, the club proud, the podcast proud. I just felt like then I was too much pressure and I was literally reading out the team sheet with the microphone, like shaking in my hands. Um, so once I had kind of had five or so minutes getting into it, I felt so much better. Um, Jim was amazing, told me what to do, when to speak, made me feel like he answered all my questions made me feel very calm. And then as we get into the game, I also didn't realise that there's no official way of knowing who scores a goal. So I turned to Jim and I'm like, so if somebody scores, like, how do we know? Like, is it something on like a, a phone or a computer? And he's like, no, no, it's just us looking at the shirts. And I was like, oh my God, I better put my glasses on. So I <laughs> had no idea what happened in that game whatsoever. Like I watched the highlights back to actually see what happened because I was so focused on not wanting to make a mistake. And especially when you don't know the other team and you nobody really. So I'm like, oh, I have no idea what's going on. So at one point before Lewis Vaughn took his free kick, he had also had another chance on goal. And I was so excited. I almost just picked up the mic and started to go for it. And Jim was like, I have to play the music first. And he put his hand on the microphone. He's like, I'll just keep this here. And then I'll let you know <laughs> when to speak. I was like, okay. So then when Sam Stanton scored, it was Jim that turned to me and went, that was Sam Stanton. And I exploded in the box and I was standing up and I had the mic ready I was like tell me when tell me when and it's just so funny because you have no sense of the noise in the box at all so to me it sounded loud when I was saying it but then when people sent me videos I was like oh that didn't sound that too loud it was okay like it sounded okay when you were in the stands and then I heard the highlights and I was like oh my god that is crystal clear like totally cringed watching the whole thing like, as you can hear, I almost lost my voice when I said number 16, it was nearly gone. And then when I said Sam Stanton, it was nearly gone. It's because I'd been screaming before I had even turned the mic on. But buzzing, it was the first time I'd ever done it. And the first goal I ever got to announce was Sam Stanton. Like, that is just, I'll be talking about that when I'm 85. Like, just brilliant. And also the fact that I didn't have to announce a Dunfermline goal. Amazing. That uh, was so like the really, cherry uh, on the cake. Couldn't have asked for better. And, uh, Couldn't have asked for better. I assume the sponsors did actually give it to, to Sam Stanton, the man in the match. You didn't just override them on that. I, <laughs> I assume you would have done otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I just made that decision and said it was Perth Audi, but yeah, no, they did. They definitely did. <laughs> and, <laughs> just to ask Christina, as well, yeah. I'm just going to jump in. I'm a bit ignorant about these things. Where in the main stand is the box? So when you come up the main stand, if you come up the steps, you have to go right. So when you come in the gates and the turnstiles, you go straight up the stairs and then you've got like the McGregor Lounge and then you've got the other point you can go into the hospitality stairwell. And then you come up the stairwell and it's right behind the stairs, right at the back. So the viewpoint from the main stand is really good because you're kind of like halfway. But the problem is there's certain posts in the way, which is what Jim was trying to explain. Like sometimes you can't see who scored if they scored at a certain place. Um, so it's kind of right in the middle of the main stand, which makes the noise and atmosphere really strange because you're kind of in the middle, but behind it all. So everything just feels weirdly out of sync. Um, but I think what I also wanted to say was there's so many cogs in the match day wheel that you just have no idea what goes on. And it's unbelievable, like the commitment and time and effort, like what Jim does as a volunteering role, and it's actually astounding that he volunteers to do that every week because that would take so long to learn. If he was to literally sit and teach me how to do that on my own, it would take months. As um, like him, the Ray TV stuff, it's just unreal that it's run by volunteers essentially on a match day. So I just think there's a, a big appreciation for that because it just comes across so professional. Yeah, 100%. And, and listen, I know you, you're going to have to disappear at some point, but I'm going to keep you on the mic for now, um, mm -hmm. just to give us a little bit just about Sam Stanton in general. Because obviously we'll, we'll talk about him at some point, but we'll likely be on for a good two or three hours. So um, <laughs> get, give me your, uh, your recap of Sam Stanton's overall performance yesterday, please. Well, what I kept turning to Jim saying was, he's just a pest. He's a pest. <laughs> he's in and about, everything, everywhere. And it's just, I thought he was going to score again. 
at near the end, I was like, Sam Stanton. I just kept pounding my fist on the desk, like, Sam Stanton, come on. Like, what a guy. He just does not, he's just like full of energy. There's no, it's just zero to 100 and he stays at 100 and he goes at 100 for the whole 90 minutes. And I mean, what a performance. Like of all the derbies, I think that's been his best performance throughout them all. And just delighted for him. I keep saying, I'm going to keep saying it. I just want to hear more from him. I want to, I want him to give <laughs> Davies Ray TV interview and let's just have an extended no one hour Sam Stanton and we can all just <laughs> get the questions answered because he's just too mysterious for me. I want to know more. I want to know more about him. But yeah, I just thought he was fantastic. Like at one point I thought we should maybe be playing him a bit further forward than we were. But then once he scored before half time, I just thought, just leave him to do what he wants. Sam Stanton can be anywhere, really. It doesn't matter. And I just, I was just like, let's just watch him do what he does best. It was in uh, in his post match for the Courier. Uh, Ian Murray finally joined your bandwagon, to be fair, and and kind of agreed that uh, Sam Stanton is the best player in the division, which I think we we've all been saying for for months now. Um, but what I liked with that is there was just that, like a typo in the article. Because um, I think what Ian Murray actually said was, pound for pound, and with his position, Sam Stanton is the best player in the division. But what it said in the paper was that pound for pound, with his potion, Sam Stanton is the best player in the division. So that that does explain quite a bit, actually. <laughs> if uh, Sam Stanton's kind of harnessing some sort of magical elixir to uh, <laughs> kind of power these performances, that um, that might explain things. But... Um, Let's uh, let's let's jump into the game then, and we'll, we'll start kind of picking this one through. So, um, I think what we'll we'll generally do, as as always happens with these derbies, we'll get carried away and we'll we'll go all over the map, but we'll try kind of to to more or less take it through in the the order that things happened, and um, see as yeah, see where it takes us and uh, how much fun we can have along the way. Um, but just a, a kind of general point for for Dunfermline, they, they've obviously had their their injury struggles uh, this season um, up till now, and they've been missing a lot of these players. And it's like, oh, if only we can get this guy back, and we can get that guy back, and and it'll be nice when they do get some of them back because there was very little <laughs> evidence from from uh, a couple of them in particular yesterday. But um, let's uh, let's start with Matty Todd, the uh, the man himself. <laughs> Um, left his swimming goggles at home, but didn't he stop him indulging in a bit of diving right early doors? Uh, 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 John, let's let's start with you. You're a big Matty Todd fan. Um, oh, he's harshly treated by the referee there. No, no, I <laughs> should, um, we should admire the fact that he did a dive like that without his goggles on. You know, maybe he is the Greg Luganis of West Life. We didn't know that. Um, no, he, uh, you know, maybe maybe there was a slight coming together, but he certainly went down. And every every Rovers player that was within that vicinity all seemed to think he was at it. So I thought I thought it was a good decision by uh, the wonderful Craig Napier, aka the the father of uh, what's his name in that film. <laughs> Marty McFly's dad, I think, is the one you're Marty looking for. Marty McFly's dad. I've said it before. I've lost it already. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Well done, Les, for for following that thread. <laughs> Thank you, Les. Les is uh, Les is on here wearing a Japanese uh, shirt, but he's also my carer for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You're right. You're right about Craig Napier, though. I, I can't decide if he looks like a really old wee boy or a really young old man, but it's one. It's one of the two. Yeah. Um, he had a different hairstyle. He had. A, he had. I, I don't know if he's bleached his hair or something. Uh, but it's when he say gets it's, a decision it's... and he runs. He'll give a decision <laughs> in point like this, and then runs twenty yards that way for no apparent uh... reason. Uh, very, it's, um, very it's, probably the, it's probably the biggest insult I can deliver for the man, but it's almost like you went on Timu or whatever it's called and you've ordered Willie Collum and he's what <laughs> arrives. Do you know what I mean? He's like a budget version of Willie Collum. Like, but, just but a, there was another a, a weird thing about yesterday. 
I think he's refereed us twice already this season, and there's been red cards in both of them. Yeah, yesterday was probably the most meatiest in, in challenges, and we never got a red card. Hmm. I thought it was a bit like the a bit like the recent Morton game, in as much as the first half looked absolutely nailed on that like a red card was coming. And at half time it seemed like both managers had gone in and said, There's a red card coming, make sure it's not you. Um I haven't double checked this. I think literally all the yellow cards in this game were in the first half. I don't think there were any yeah, after yeah. half time. Um which I think suited us more than it suited them, to be fair. Um but I um yeah, I, I, I actually thought he, overall that he handled the game quite well. But yeah, he does have a very I mean, borderline kind of flamboyant style, um, <laughs> Craig Napier. He's very expressive. Uh, jazzy refereeing. Um, Blair, in terms of the, after that, um, a ludicrous dive in the, <laughs> the third minute, the rest of that kind of first half hour, Person, without kind of creating too much, I thought I thought the Ferman started the better. Would you mm. agree with that? Yeah, so I was obviously wasn't at the game. Um, I was watching online, um, and it, it was starting to feel a wee bit uncomfortable, um, just in the sense that obviously when you're watching on the telly, you don't get a feel for really how the game's flowing. You just get a sense of kind of where the action is, like you're seeing one half more than the other or one goalkeeper more than the other, whatever. Um, and it did it did certainly feel, um, certainly they were on top. Um, that being said, um, it wasn't like they created a huge amount. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't, it never really felt like, I don't know, it never really felt like a goal was coming. It's a weird one, but it, it, it kind of felt like two teams that were effectively cancelling each other out. Um, and it, it felt a lot like a lot of the derbies this season where they were playing the occasion and we were playing the game kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, like they came all guns blazing um, against this childish Wraith Rovers team um, and wanted to put them to the sword. And the Rovers just kind of absorbed it, I would say, which was quite refreshing actually. And it never really, never really looked too dangerous. But we also never really got a foothold in the game properly, probably until the thirty eighth minute. Really, mm -hmm. was was the the changing point. To to kind of touch on the the tactical side just for a, a second, and then we'll get back to the the daft stuff. I think <laughs> one of the big things that determined that first half, <clears throat> the last few games before Saturday, James McPake had kind of abandoned his back five or his back mm -hmm. three. And he'd, he'd been playing a back four, but putting Benny back in meant that they went back to a back three. <clears throat> and whether that was slightly a surprise to Ian Murray or whether it was just the nature of the way this goes, I thought a lot of the reason that Dunfermline looked like they were more sort of in control or, or, or undeniably they had more of the ball <clears throat> was in their back line. And it was basically because Rudden and, to a slightly lesser extent, Vaughn, were pressing by themselves against the mm -hmm. back three. So between Benny, and this is a test for me, Fagan, Walcott, and Welch yeah. Hayes, I think. <laughs> well played. They were always able to find a free man, because quite simply it was three against two. And it looked like they then always had, and they did have more of the ball. But as you say, the game took place entirely in front of the Rovers' back four. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> Fagan Walcott a couple of times, who actually that was relatively impressive. That's the first time I've seen him. Was kind of stepping out of the back line and kind of moving the game, and it was kind of mildly not concerning, but a little bit like, oh, hang on, if they're they look all right so far, but they never got behind us. They never really gave um, Scott Brown and and you and Murray much of a much of an issue. Um, Leslie, for your kind of or sorry, from your point of view, how did you see that kind of opening period? Um, yeah, more or less up to the well, yeah, the first half hour or so. Aye, I mean, I think it started, and within the first few minutes, it was quite clear this was not the same banter leading Dunfermline that we'd had in previous league games. I think, particularly with a few of the players being back who'd been injured, Benedictus in particular. 
it was quite clear that they were a lot more organised and a lot less chaotic. And you kind of thought after a few minutes, right, we, we could be in, in, in a bit of trouble here. We're not going to be able to just stroll through them. And I think that, that was borne out by the fact we really didn't get a lot. And, you know, I kind of until about halfway through the first half, I was just thinking we'd actually get in virtually nothing out of this. Having said that, you know, I'd, I'd agree with you. I don't think Dunfermline looked particularly like scoring. Uh, Dubrovsky did have a very good save actually in front of the South Stand at one point, which, uh, you know, for, for reasons we'll come on to later, maybe doesn't get talked about as much as it should. You know, they did have a very, very good chance. But, you know, I think Dunfermline had a lot of, the, they were in a lot, of, it was a very different animal to the, the team we'd seen before, albeit without looking hugely dangerous, but one that was, I think, quite capable at uh, just cancelling us out and neutralising us. Yeah. Um, it did It did get quite kind of scrappy in that first half. And I, I don't know, I don't know who that worked better for, but my suspicion is it was, <laughs> helped them a little bit. For the, for the reason that you say, Blair, that they were kind of, trying to make it an occasion almost whether the Rovers were happy or just to, to kind of play it um, as the game. I don't know if any of you managed to catch um, Sam North and his, his footy yeah. adventures, his kind of YouTube piece, which is brilliant to be fair. I think it's yeah. very easy to kind of sneer about the the YouTubers and all this kind of stuff, but genuinely they're really, really very good. Um, Easton picks up a yellow card after about half an hour. Um I've, I've not. I didn't actually see the the sort of the incident very well. He maybe catches Welch Hayes slightly late. He maybe doesn't. Honestly, don't know. But Welch Hayes kind of crumples to the floor and he's he's rolling about the place. And uh, as soon as the yellow cards out of um, Craig Napier's pocket, he just kind of hops up and and jogs away. And I was laughing at the time because so it's genuinely like the the kind of blatant kind of shithousing that I have no choice but to respect. But the thing with Sam North, sorry, is he's in the railway stand and he's filming it and you get a perfect view of Craig Napier's reaction to it. And he's he's like 70% furious, 30% perplexed. But it, like, it's just the thing is, I think in the stand, everybody's quite annoyed and they're like, can he's having you on ref? Like he's absolutely conned you there. And it's quite nice being able to see actually in the referee's face. He's like, I have been conned there. I have actually, like, he's he's had me on there. And he kind of take that yellow card back. He's already booked Easton. But um, I just thought it was it was notable. It's worth um, it's worth going back to. But um, very quickly after that, um, what we do get is this kind of free kick on the edge of the box. And actually, again, just to, to kind of give little bits of credit where it's due, I thought of all the Dunfermline players, I thought Kyle Benedictus was maybe the best mm-hmm. over the course of that game. And it's in the build-up to the goal. The Rovers, really their first chance of the half. Um, Mullen is kind of released on the right-hand side and he puts in a brilliant cross. And it looks for all the world like Vaughn's going to put it in. And it's Benny who gets in and gets a toe to it, makes a really decent kind of intervention. Um, and then it's almost immediately the after that, aftermath of that that the, the free kick is given. Um, and that's obviously when the fun begins. Um, <laughs> Blair, give me your thoughts on the uh, the goal, please. I mean, it was, it was just Sam Stanton being Sam Stanton. Um, <clears throat> it was lovely. It was a, a decent free kick um, from Vaughn, not by any stretch of imagination his best. Um, it was um, Dennis Mimet. Um, at his best, um, three year deal, three year deal. Honestly, the guy's <laughs> rank and it's hilarious. Um, I mean, it's it's not a great save because it's not a not a great free kick. Like it's on target, he's got to make a save, but he just pams it straight back into danger. Like there's no no attempt to to kind of play the ball away. It's just he, he strikes me as the kind of guy who just lives in a five second bubble, like ball here must save ball, save ball, worry about problem next. Like, there's just no thought process behind it. It's terrible. So he pans it back out, and just pure instinct, Sam Stanton. Um, and I'll, <laughs> I'm will i going to use the line now, um, but I, as a science teacher, I came across a really interesting scientific fact um, the other day that sums up this 
um, this goal perfectly from Sam Stanton, which is that the, the earth is 70% covered by water um, and the other 30% is covered by Sam Stanton because he's <laughs> just he's just everywhere. It's like ball drops. It drops to Sam. Of course it does. Um, and a great header just nods it straight into the empty net. And again, I will say, not as easy a header as people will make it out to be because it's very easy to just header that straight back at the goalkeeper because that's, that's what happens a lot of the time. I was going to say, I think you almost did him a bit of a disservice by saying that he's acting on instinct. I think that's almost, um, it's a little bit more than just instinct. Mm. He, he does very well to just kind of Fair. guide yeah. that into the the kind of the side of the goal. And you can see both Benny and the goalkeeper just looking at each other like, it's just mm, glorious. Yeah, he's going to get into that. Um, and full credit to Sam Stanton for winning the free kick um, initially as well. Yeah. Um, uh, John, did you, do you think at some point um, Dennis Mehmet might start to suspect that Vonnie's going to shoot with these free kicks? Well, <laughs> yes, I think I think he maybe got the notion now that that might happen. Um, we all, I think, we all thought he was going to shoot, um, and as you said, um, he got he got a hand to it. But it wasn't he? You know, I've I've watched I've watched Kevin so often. And when he he pushes these away, now he gets it far enough away from it. It's not goalkeeping that I've ever seen before, but it seems to be a common theme with goalkeepers now. They must all be taught to get the ball away as far as they can. But obviously Mehmet missed that class. He was <laughs> in the after. You know, and Blair, as a teacher, I think you should be on his case telling them. <laughs> You should have been at that class, but it was No, I think he's doing a fantastic job, John. I think <laughs> he should keep I think he should keep and, doing what he's doing. And and as you boys have said, the header is you know, it isn't an easy header and he just makes it look so good. I wouldn't say he makes it easy, but he makes it look so good and it kinda brilliant and then he's off and running and we're hearing Christina giving the big licks, which was wonderful. I I I thought it was great for Christina to to have Sam Stanton, you know, all the stars lined up for her there with the with the goal. So it was it was great. Yeah, that's uh, for the the audio listeners. Christina has now dropped off the call, so we're we're going to say nice things about her now <laughs> that she can't hear. Because <laughs> um, that was the same. I thought she was absolutely brilliant. Um, just for for whatever you need your PA announcer to be, I just thought she absolutely nailed it. And as you say, John, yeah. couldn't have asked for that. You know, I mean, literally, know, I think she did ask for, for Sam Stanton to score for <laughs> She really did, aye. Yeah, the boys that, you know, Jim and, Jim and Johnny have, have added to the the thing this season because they're, they're great at bigging up and, and getting the atmosphere going. But Christina stepped in there and, and was on a par with these two yesterday. It was brilliant. Uh, Johnny's brilliant at that. It's what he does. Yeah. Um, he really is. Um, yeah. And obviously, so was Gordon before him. But uh, I think uh, Johnny yeah, is, is um, definitely worth yeah. a mention. He's, he's excellent. And I still get people saying to me when I'm on the pitch at half time with a microphone in my hand, "You do not need to shout." <laughs> I've learnt my lesson. <laughs> I was Have going you? to say just quickly on Gordon Adamson. I am. Um, I taught his grandson years and years ago um, at Queen Anne. Ben is a Rovers fan who was at a school in Dunfermline, so it was me and him against the rest of them. But um, I didn't... I, it was at the time, kind of before I was involved as a volunteer at all, I didn't know who Gordon Adamson was. And he came to parents' evening, and he sat down, and he started talking, and I had the most surreal kind of <laughs> realisation, kind of halfway through going, you're, you're the guy on the microphone at Star Park, aren't you? <laughs> like, just glorious. And did you just say that? Just recognising voice alone. I did. I did, I. Brilliant. I said, well, actually, no, I never. I think I said it to Ben. I was like, your granddad does the voice, eh? I grew up <laughs> listening to your granddad. Is Ben the one that, that played for Dunfermline? No. And now plays, no, he, he's got another grandson who signed for Dunfermline and for Gordon's sake and his grandson's sake has now left Dunfermline and he plays for the youth development team at Livingston. Good lad. It's a better <laughs> idea. Um... Leslie, any anything you want to give us on the on the goal, please, and indeed anything else in the last kind of five minutes of the half, you can take us up the half time too, please. 
not much to add. I mean, I was also on, on Wraith TV. I'd hoped to be at the game, but I uh, woke up on Thursday morning and thought the Grim Reaper was coming. And so I was polaxed for a few days. So I was uh, very, very grateful to be able to kind of tune in uh, remotely. Um, I think, yeah, just, just a word for Christina as well. And, like, and a word for people like me who have shit eyesight. Because when a goal goes in in front of the North Stand, the announcer is usually the first person that tells me who's scored. Because, you know, just like balls move about, players move about, ball goes in the net, noise goes up, people start running, and you're usually relying on the announcer to kind of tell you what's happened. And it just, it came across brilliantly on Wraith TV as well. That- Christina coming across loud and clear, number 16, Sam Stanton. Just what a, what a, what a, what a great moment. And they had just started as well. What, it was an absolutely terrific header because, yeah, I mean, to, to aim at that big empty part of the net where there was no goalie or where there was no defender or anything, to get it just precisely looping in like that, that's that's not by by accident. And I mean, just, just a word on, on Denny's Mehmet as well. And I'm going to go on to my little re- retro <laughs> games analogies. So, not not my favourite game, not Pro Evil 6, but Pro Evolution, I think is at 4, might be in 2009. If you go into Rangers and you go down to the reserves, right down at the bottom, you can find Graham Smith like our Graham Smith. I, mm. And if you put him in a team and put him in goals, it's actually like having Denny's Mehmet in goals because when <laughs> you shoot, 80% of the time, the ball will just whiz past and go in the net. Sometimes like he'll be in a position where the ball will bounce off him and a save will happen by accident. And then sometimes like with my controllers really old and like the triangle button gets stuck and then the keeper saves it, but then immediately releases it into the path of whoever's coming in. So this <laughs> is what like Denny's Mehmet is like. He's like, you know, a kind of, old version of, uh, of of Graham Smith or something like that and he he didn't didn't let us down again and you know given how we've we've been with conceding goals I think as soon as it went I was just like right let's get to the end of the half without conceding by hook or by crook and then we can see what's what and we did Duncan can I just say I'm just about to shout Alison Alison book me another therapy session somebody's mentioned <laughs> Graham Smith after his calamity at Clifton Hill <laughs> Oh, no. I oh, mean, that was awful. Me. That Let's that not. goal didn't even make the highlights because there was so little danger. The camera mm-hmm. had just panned away, and he still managed to end up dispossessed and concede a goal. I also missed it. I had a bovril in my hand, and I, li- I literally looked down to take the lid off the bovril, and I looked up, and the ball was in the net. <laughs> I've still no idea how it happened because there was no replay, like you say. Oh dear awful. me, that's. Aye, that's that's brought us right back down to earth. Eh? Just a, a reminder of uh, of what football can yet. <laughs> just, um, just just because this this podcast likes to be completely up and and kind of correct on all our figures and everything. That three year deal that they gave Dennis Mehmet was only just in the summer there. So <laughs> I actually thought they gave him a three year deal and only had eighteen months left. He's under contract until twenty twenty six. Twenty twenty six. That's brilliant. I, can I, just say, I almost fair, he was, don't get relegated. And his, I was going to say, in his defence, he was he was decent in League One, so he'll be all right next year. Robbie, I mean, Robbie will be watching this, saying, "I've said this all along." The Dunfermline um, fans loved him, hate him, loved him, yeah. and now they'll be hating him again. He is rot. Oh. I was going to say just very quickly on the Christina thing as well. I, I agree with Les. Came through so clearly on Wraith TV. It was actually. It was a really nice moment, and I honestly think in a season of lovely moments, there's been so many great moments this season. That is up there with one of my genuine favourite moments. It was the passion in her voice. Like, you couldn't pretend to be that excited about a goal. Um, And the, the great thing for Christina, as much as anything else, is the amount of media coverage that we now have at Starch Park. Because if you watch on the highlights... It comes through crystal clear. You can hear the voice. It's absolutely beautiful. But Ben is doing the video behind the goals. So he's standing basically right in front of that washing line flag thing that they had in the section northwest boys down the bottom corner and the north stand. He's standing right in front of them as the goal goes in. So on the, the other footage, which is on the, the Twitter feed um, today, um, or it might be yesterday actually, um, but the, the Twitter feed went up and it's, the same goal, obviously, the same announcement, the same timing, but there's just a lovely chorus of boos across it from the Dunfermline fans as they announce, as she announces Sam Stanton, and it's just beautiful. 
I absolutely loved it. Aye, absolutely brilliant. It really was. Um, so we get to going at half time. Uh, not a huge amount else kind of happened. The, the kind of back end of that half, and I don't know. I felt like at that point, the the oh, well, actually, sorry, I nearly forgot. I nearly got myself out of order. First thing that really happens in the second half is the save of the season. Mm. Anyway, I don't know. Anybody, don't think anybody's going to argue with that. An unbelievable save. Now I know, um, Les and Blair, you obviously were watching it on Wraith TV at the time from the other end of the ground. I thought it was further out than it was. Mm. So I thought it was, I was like, "Well, that's an incredible save." But one of these where you think, you know, that's a good save that that you see sometimes. Seeing it back in the highlights, and it's maybe 16 yards or something like that, and it's hit with such pace. Absolutely, I mean, phenomenal goalkeeping. Um, let's talk about this for a while. Uh, <laughs> so, Blair, give me your thoughts um, first of all, please, just on on what is a phenomenal save. It really is, and it's it's Kev all over. Like the the, the there's plenty of Rovers fans in the in the south stand and and main stand and whatever who have reasons to gripe about Kev because he's. Like we've said before, he's not the typical kind of goalkeeper we're used to, or his kicking's not really up to to scratch, or whatever it happens to be coming out for crosses. Nobody in a Rovers um, fan is ever going to question his shot stopping because he's been great all season. But that save is it's actually ridiculous. The more I watch it as well, I was saying before we, we kind of started recording, for me it's like, he takes an option that I think most goalkeepers wouldn't have done. I think most goalkeepers, because it's quite close to his body, I think most goalkeepers would have, you know, thrown two hands at it, tried to get their body behind the ball, tried to get just something. And he, he makes a really conscious decision to go with one hand and just get a really strong hand and effectively lift it over the bar and use all the pace that's on the ball and just redirect it. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal goalkeeper. What do you think uh, Dennis Mehmet would have done faced with that shot with? He'd have probably dived in the other direction, I imagine, in some calamitous way. Um, and then Leslie, give me, or, palmed, or palmed it straight back to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leslie, give me your thoughts on that, please. I mean, I'm, I'm minded of something. It was Jamie McDonald, actually, when we had him, and he was, he was on a, a view from the terrace, and they were doing a wee segment on him, and he said, what you have to remember when our shot comes in, he says, it's with the sea of bodies, you don't see the ball coming as a keeper until it's only a few metres away. And so, you know, you, you might see on TV the ball arcing in, but you've, as a keeper, you have to react very quickly. And, I mean, one thing I will say about Big Kev is he does not let a bad performance get into his head. It would have been very easy after the Arbroath game to, to go into his shell, to, to, to have that playing in his mind every single time the ball came near him. But he, he seems to have this ability to just take a bad game and just compartmentalise it and then just put it away and forget about it. And that, that's not just his performance on the pitch. You know, he's out there razzing up the Dunfermline fans, noising them up throughout the game. He's able to just package up what's gone before and just forget about it. You know, And I think very few Championship keepers, I think, could make a save like that. And you know, and you saw folk um, from other teams saying, "Oh, you know, if you guys want to go up, you need to upgrade your goalkeeper." Look at Livingston and they had Neil Alexander. You know, you look at a lot of the no mark keepers in the championship who give you a seven out of ten every week. Granted, they might not sometimes make the errors that Kev do, but I don't think any of them are going to make a save like that. And that's you know, that's what he brings you that that quality, those those moments of of absolute brilliance that, that you get from Dubrovsky. Listen, I'm I'm not convinced, and there's some very good goalkeepers in the division. I'm not convinced any of them save that. No. Um, just quite quite frankly, I just think that's that is the very kind of pinnacle, very kind of top one two percent of his ability shining out there. Um, as he kind of it's the athleticism, that the isn't it? Exactly. Oh, that's I mean, it. It's, it's just. It's worth I mean, just it's, saying it's, that briefly. You know, I said no mark goalkeepers, but you're right, Duncan. The <laughs> standard of goalkeeping in the championship across the board is very high. And there's a <clears> lot of really good young goalkeepers, but I don't think any of them would, would have made that save. 
No, I mean, even even like simple um, kind of like Callum Ferry, I think a really, really good goalkeeper at Queen's Park, but he gives away maybe four inches in height to Kev. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. if, he's, if he reacts as quickly, I don't think he saves that. Um, even a seasoned campaigner like McDonald, like who's a, who's as steady a goalkeeper as we've ever had, I don't think he gets near that. And I think if he does get near it, he pams it into the net. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just, I think it's the... It's the you hear so many goalkeepers being criticised for having like poppadom wrists and all this stuff mm. and like oh he's got a touch to it but he's not kept it away. That is exactly the kind of goal, that, kind of shot you expect to see almost like oh keeper's got fingertips to it but could not keep it out, and he does so so well to keep it out. It's also just quite funny watching it back how similar that goal is to eighty percent of the shooting drills that you see teams doing kind of warming up. Um, so James Brown, obviously it's, it's not his fault, it's completely inadvertent, but the uh, Ewan Otto actually tries to sort of play a through ball initially, and just in the way that James Brown manages to get his foot across to it, it's very similar to the way that like Mickey Cameron will just be laying <laughs> off uh, kind of warm-ups at 5-3, to three and uh, lets Otto kind of run onto that and just put his foot straight through it. It's the, 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 how close he is to the goal and the power he gets behind it. Um, John, give me a, a little bit from you, please, on on that save and, and just on on uh, Kevin Dabrowski in general, please. Well, I think like everybody at the start, Kevin Kevin looked like he had a mistake in him, and uh, but as Les says, it's the way that he can just park it and get on, and um, the the save. I didn't appreciate how great the save was. Till I got home late last night and watched the replay over and over again, and um, it, it was quite phenomenal. And it's as good a save, you know. We all talk about the Davy McGurn triple save against Air United a few years ago, the Davy McGurn save at East End Park, and then we run up and Damien scores a second one against that team again. But <laughs> the the save yesterday as a one-off was as good a save as probably been seen at Starks Park ever, I would say. Mm-hmm. It, it was just phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And we, do, we don't know what the importance of that save, you know, you can't say whether had they got there, the, the, that would have given them so much momentum in the game yesterday. Mm-hmm. The whole game could have turned around. So... The importance of it, it was quite phenomenal as well. I was going to say that. I think that's the, it's, we talk about, you know, game defining moments, season defining yeah. moments and all that kind of stuff. But if you're a Dunfermline player or a Dunfermline fan, like Otto does everything right. He does absolutely, he could not do anything differently or, or wouldn't do anything differently if he had the option again. But you must be at that moment thinking, it's no other day. It's not going to happen today. I remember you saying it, Blair, about that McGurn save at East End Park, where yeah. it looks like so much of a goal that you actually get half of the crowd reaction first, mm-hmm. and you see it with this one as well. There's people behind yeah, the goal who are halfway Jim, Jim up. McIntyre, Jim McIntyre, who was in charge of Dunfermline then, claimed it was a goal, um, that McGurn had pushed it, kept it out from behind the line. He went in the press and said that. Um, but and. Yesterday again, though, there was the Wraith Rovers opponent conundrum where they take off the best player. So surely <laughs> they took off Ewan Otto, and he was he was the player that was making them tick. Madness. A hundred percent. We 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 are going to need a jingle for championship <laughs> managers taking off their best players because it keeps happening, mm. and it's stupid <laughs> like that. Um, I couldn't believe that as I watched that happen. Like, so, so they're bringing on the boy Lewis McCann, who I think fair to say has not had a very good season. Um, I thought he looked very good in the League Cup game. I think I said that in the preview. He gave um, mm-hmm. Keith Watson a kind of torrid time um, doing a bit of direct running. It's one of these things where he's, he signed a new contract and they were all delighted, and he has not kicked his own arse since um, yeah. to the point where I think they've they've really kind of lost patience with him. Well, but I think it's. Sorry, Duncan, if you remember, there was even Dunfermline supporters saying on forums that he's never been the same player since uh, 
Kevin gave him a wee bump after the penalty <laughs> game at East End Park, you know. Aye, that, that, that's, that's, that's one of my favourite moments of the season. The, the <laughs> still great. photo. I, f- I forget the photographer's name, but um, I think I paid something like £6.50 for the, the watermark-free high-definition <laughs> version of that image. I enjoyed it so much. Um, and uh, he has, he has, he's really kind of gone into his shell since then. But and, it seemed like a fair enough a fair enough shout bringing him on, right? But when you look at that Dunfermline fan at that point, it's so the 72nd minute, uh, so that Dunfermline team at that point, they were still, I don't know if necessarily they were controlling the game, but they still had a, a really, really mm. good foothold in the midfield between you and Otto and um, Chris Hamilton. They were getting their foot in the ball. They were winning the ball back between the two of them. The game was kind of happening in front of them, more or less. But in front of them, they were doing nothing. So um, Kane Ritchie Hosler, who uh, I think we were led to believe is some sort of footballing messiah with no championship goals and no championship assists, uh, did nothing all afternoon to the point where I kept waiting for him to do something. He actually, at one point in the first half, he slide tackles Sam Stanton and it's a really good tackle. I thought... That's a funny thing for your kind of star winger to be the best. The best thing he does all afternoon is <laughs> tack on somebody in the halfway line. Thought he was absolutely terrible. I, 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 I mean, I tell you this, he has to be better than that. Because mm. um, he, was, he was rotten. Did nothing all afternoon. You've got Matty Todd, who uh, disappeared after about the half hour mark. Um, and then the other boy is uh, Ben Summers who, of the three of them, was more involved than the other two, but didn't there, he wasn't there creating much. He was running about and he was passing the ball about, but he was, was doing nothing. And was the one that got substituted out of the three of them? Well, he was the one they took off kind of later on. The, the, yeah, he was the next one to come off. But that, but the, the, first, the first substitution he makes, to take you and Otto off, who, bear yeah. in mind, the only real proper chance he'd had to this point, he had also been the one who had that shot, I thought was... was ludicrous. I was delighted. Wow. Like absolutely beaming in the stand when he goes off. And you could hear the the booing in the away mm. end. And um I didn't notice it at the time, but apparently the Dunfermline fans did. James McPaik was standing on the touchline kind of shaking his head at them booing his decision. Mm. And it's like, mm, okay. But uh, like I mean I'll I'll not say this very often. I thought the power supporters were bang on there because that was a yeah. dreadful decision. A terrible idea to take him off. And I thought that was a real kind of defining point in that game because it, it turned from them being able to kind of keep plugging away to needing something special and Lewis McCann was never going to give them something special um, to to borrow a, a style of reference from Les here he looked like he was jumping on a kind of a, an early online game suffering from kind of significant lag every high ball he goes for he's like half a second late <laughs> It's yeah. really weird. Someone had mentioned that on Pine Bovro before the game, so I was looking out for it. And he's 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 like he's jumping on a delay. It's really bizarre. Um and I thought I thought I thought that was huge. I thought that was a huge kind of turning point that really handed the rovers a fair bit of, of impetus at that point. And um Jack Hamilton comes on at, at approximately the same time. Um and I thought he was excellent as well, just in terms of the we spoke before about the fact that Zach Rudden gives you a lot of kind of mobility and, and um, kind of he just kind of runs about and, and smashes into people. Jack Hamilton came on and did that to, to very good effect as well, but in a very kind of deliberate, targeted manner. One is headers and everything. Um, but that certainly... Ah, you're absolutely right, John. I thought that substitution was um, was wild. Um, and then that really kind of takes us up to the second goal. I was going <laughs> to say just before that, yeah. if I can, um, I was like, obviously, like I say, watching. So by this point, I was I watched the first half whilst working, um, <laughs> and <laughs> I actually shouted when Santon scored as well. I was like, oh <laughs> shit, sorry. Um, but by the second, by the basically half time, I was um, out and I was sitting just watching it. 
Um, and there was a moment, and it's the the first, for anybody who wants to know why Sam Stanton is the best player in his position in the championship, watch the very first clip after half time in the highlights package and watch the way that Vaughn responds to it. And it's exactly what I talked about after the Arbroath game, that we lacked leaders, we lacked anybody who like really drove the game on. So Stanton sort of bears down on... I think it's maybe Welsh Hayes. I can't remember who the defender is that's got the ball. But Sam Stanton is chasing a lost cause, absolutely chasing a lost cause, and puts in this sliding tackle, wins the ball, gets up, and I think the ball drops to Benny, who kind of sclaffs a clearance away. I'm maybe getting the defenders wrong at this point, but somebody kind of sclaffs a clearance, um, and then the ball comes back down, and it's the one where Connolly kind of runs to the right, and then cuts it back into Vaughn. Uh, Vaughn plays him through, sorry. Cuts it back to Vaughn, and Vaughn tries to just clip it over Mehmet, but kind of overcooks it a little bit. But there's a visible moment when Stanton wins that ball where Vaughn's like, right, we're having them. And he's right in on top of it. And it's that beautiful kind of tiger cage thing that I've been talking about all season. It's just great. Like, really, really good for Stanton. And he did it. He actually did it twice. There's only one of them in the highlights. But there was another one. I actually was sat. And I, I genuinely said, go on, Sam. And he, he clattered. I think it was Chris Hamilton. He clattered. Yeah. And Can Hamilton didn't get up. Sorry, Blair. Yeah. And I, I've i got visions of Sam Stanton being like Inspector Gadget when he comes into these <laughs> things, right? And he goes to himself, Telescopic leg, and he slides <laughs> it in, and he hooks the ball back. Brilliant. Nobody does it like him. Nobody, no. and he's just so good at it. That's my only cartoon thing I'll ever say on the podcast. <laughs> Sorry, boys. I don't believe that. I think we'll get more. Um, yeah. No, but you're absolutely spot on. I know exactly the one that you mean. You're 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 absolutely bang on. He is. He's chasing Welch Hayes. He basically dispossesses Welch Hayes twice. Mm -hmm. He manages yes. to recover. He kind of gets it to Benny, who you're right, scoffs is the right word. He just kind of puts his left foot through it and kind of loops it up. Um, the only thing that's slightly off is your uh, your chronology. It's immediately after the second goal oh, um, is it? at that point. But I think you're right. I think the first one, as you said, like, it happened twice. I think the first yeah. one was just before that. Because that's right, what okay. I've got in my notes is it's at the point where Jack Hamilton comes on and starts kind of winning these headers. That's right. That, Sam Stanton suddenly, Christina said it earlier on, she said, oh, I kind of wanted them to be playing a little bit further forward. And I don't know if it was maybe Sean Byrne being there as well, but he just decides that actually, you know what, I'm taking this to them. And and yeah, all of a sudden, Sam Stanton is just diving into their back line and he's just at them again and again. And it goes right at the last minute of the game. And I mean, I don't know how many miles he must have covered over the course of that game. And he's still just going at them. And it's absolutely that, as much as anything, um, is why I think he was deservedly kind of the man of the match. Setting aside the goal and everything, I just thought he was, he was that kind of driving force um, through it all. But in terms of the second goal, and I mean, you said, boy, there about it's, it's kind of inspiring the others in the way that Vaughn reacts. The second goal is a very good, although Sam Stanton's not particularly involved, it's a very good um, example of all of that. Is actually, I think Sean Byrne kind of smashes into a challenge in the midfield. I think it's knocked down, and it's kind of Connolly and Vaughn both just clattering into folk, really, and uh, making sure that they're in the way, that they're not going to give it up too easy. I mean, Louis Vaughn must give away a foot in height to um, Malachi, Fagan, Walcott, and he. He clatters him out the first one. I think the boy's looking for the free kick, and when he doesn't get it, that's when he more or less just kind of shoves Lou to the ground. And then um, the quick free kick is it's just very, very good uh, kind of quick thinking, obviously, and, and kind of perfectly executed. Um, but, Leslie, give me your thoughts on the uh, on that goal, please. Absolutely. I think the I would sort of take it back to Jack Hamilton winning the, winning the flick on, and that's something Jack Hamilton does very well. And it's why, although you can understand him being maybe frustrated that he doesn't start, having Jack Hamilton as a finisher is so useful because he can do stuff like that for you. So he gets that, wins it out the air, ball ends up down in the corner. Um, what for, for Connolly as well, who's maybe not been as good as as, as we've we're, we've used to been seeing from him for a few weeks, but had a had a had a good run. 
those quick free kicks, sometimes we get away with them. Sometimes the referee says no. Um, we've you know, we, we've had a goal. We've had a goal in a very similar position from that before. And sure enough, the ball gets moving. And before you know it, the ball is then beautifully fired into the corner of the net from Dylan Easton. And I think Michael Watson had been saying this in our, on our group chat and also on, on, on Twitter. I think you know, Easton, that's a great goal for Easton to get. He's been somebody who's been really struggling for confidence in the last few months, if not weeks. He's been really struggling. And, you know, if that had been Dylan Easton a couple of weeks ago, that would probably have ended up in row TT. But, you know, he hits it very nicely, beautifully, beautifully positioned, gets a goal in front of the south stand, and we, we kick on from there. And I don't, want to, I don't want to kind of get too far ahead of the goal, because I know we'll come to that, but just from what happened thereafter, and then the, the Stanton thing as well, it's the first time in months where I've seen us not look like a deer in headlights when we get a setting goal. There was no panic. It was just, we, we just kept going. And we actually looked more like scoring after that than, than we did before which is a Definitely. complete reversal to anything we've seen, the complete blind panic that we've seen in recent weeks. So that was that was great all round. Can I just say, wonderful defending by the, <laughs> by the guy who <laughs> steps out the way to let it go. I wasn't even step out the way, John. It's, it's, I think somebody put it in the chat. It was maybe you, Duncan. So maybe, I'll let, maybe let you go because I think I'm about to steal your reference. You've got a movie well, no, reference so, so. for this one. I've got I've got a book of references for this one because I think the so we, the I was trying to think earlier on like I was like that those kind of quick reflexes remind me of something but it, the, just the way that he manages to kind of so quickly get himself out the road and I was trying to I was like who is that where have I seen that before remember when that Iraqi guy threw a shoe at George W Bush. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's the only time I can remember someone <laughs> so effectively managing to move themselves out of the way of an object moving at that speed. It's. Uh, I mean, just... it's the thing is, the worst bit about it is it's at head height. Like, you're a defender. Header it. Like, I could almost understand if it was, you know, kind of, because he's side on. So if it's kind of chest height and he's worried he might handle it, he's worried that he might get his arm in the way, but it's head height and it's like, it just reminded me of the Matrix. It's like that moment where he just kind of, kind of like smoothly moves out the way as the ball passes him by. And then the best bit of all of it is his reaction afterwards because he realises, it's like, oh, shit. I shouldn't have yeah, done that. Yeah, he kind of does a full pirouette. Like yeah. he sort of... He's like a, like a frustrated person in a ballet as his whole body expresses his emotions. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, phenomenal. Uh, you, and wonder I, any... he, you wonder if he, he signed, did that move and said, Dennis, it's yours. <laughs> You've got I, to give, give, give the guy some credit. He's, he's spent the whole season no being able to get a game for Livingston. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's far from... Uh, yeah, far from qualified to be there, I think, is the problem. <laughs> just, just, aye, it's, uh, it's really good. I, I, I don't know what it is between him and Mehmet, if they th if he thinks it's going wide or, or what it is, because yeah. it's... She doesn't fancy getting hit in the face, does he? No, that's, it's, I think it was Robbie who said it. Was... As well. John Hughes. Full head of hair that... Well, I was going Maybe to say, keeping the that. keeping the references to the Matrix going, he looks a wee bit like was it no Bros, the brothers <laughs> for Bros that were in Matrix Three or something, and they've got their dreadlocks. <laughs> We've got uh, cutting edge <laughs> references on the good the day. I think the most Brilliant. recent one's been nineteen ninety nine or something. That but, um, kind of beat it. Aye, Robbie said it, and listen, far be it from this podcast to try and kind of give any kind of credit to John Hughes, but. It, re it is the absolute epitome of sometimes you just need someone to take one in the dish. Yeah, That's all it is. If he just stands still, mm -hmm. they've got a chance going into that last 10 minutes. And instead, <laughs> whatever it is he's doing. Um, and that's that's just, that's that's what you get when you're um, mince. Aye, at the bottom end of the league, basically. <laughs> <laughs> just... Uh, Aye. But, but, I mean, aye, full credit to, to Dylan Great Easton. It's a, it's a really, really good finish. I have to tell you, I'm, you, I'm not kind of generally a very big fan of these quick free kicks. It seems like one no. of these things that sort of with the way that 
kind of the footballing authorities seem determined to stamp the fun out, stamp the fun out of the game entirely, and like anything that might be remotely kind of quick thinking, I'm amazed that, that you're still allowed them. And it feels quite arbitrary to me the ones that you do get and the ones that you don't get. It seems like some referees have just decided they will never allow a quick free kick. Um, so I was quite surprised and delighted to see that that it was um, it was kind of allowed to continue. But um, it's yeah, the fact very, that very, there, was, very there was another one, another one behind him. Was oh, Jack Hamilton was standing. So if if it hadn't come to Easton, Hamilton was standing on the edge of the box, ready to have a go as well. Like it was really, really quick thinking for for Vaughn to to kind of get the ball moving. Um, and actually, I, I'm going to say it just because it's hilarious. Was it a free kick? Like he kind of he bodied the boy out the way and then got bodied back. To me, it looked kind of a bit fifty-fifty. I'm not sure why one got given and the other didn't. To be honest, I think if you I'm wanted to did. interpret it sort of charitably, I think Vaughn Vaughn kind of goes into the guy shoulder to shoulder, and then the other boy's kind of in the back of Vaughn and kind of okay. pushes him down. But as it, it, I say, it, it, um, Fagan Walcott. I've yeah. said these these double barrel names too many times. I've got them wrong at least once. <laughs> but he's he's almost so much bigger than Vaughn. He's almost got no no, no option but to sort of tower <laughs> over him and and uh, crash him to the floor. But uh, yeah, uh, brilliant kind of quick thinking. I thought Aidan Connolly was excellent when he came on as well. Um, and then Leslie, you just said it again. I've I've got it written down here. It looked so much more likely to go to three 0 than it ever did to go to two one. Um, I think their best chance of the final kind of 10, 15 minutes is just a long diagonal that makes its way to, to Josh Edwards, who's in the box and he kind of gets a fairly tame effort straight into the arms of uh, of Kevin Dubrovsky, whereas the Rovers had a, a good few chances in that kind of last 10 minutes. Um, Stanton has an effort that goes over the bar. Um Aidan Connolly has that kind of chip that, that goes over the bar as well. Um, Jack Hamilton had a kind of lobbed attempt. I don't think made it into the highlights, but I think actually, I think he'll be annoyed with himself. I think he, yeah, he probably yeah. should have done a wee bit better with he that. Was offside, more time. I think. Oh, was he? Uh, he, he was offside already. The they they turned the ball up for it. That'll be why he, it wasn't in the, in the highlights. Through, I think Stanton would have been onside. The two of them kind of came through together, and I think Stanton would have been onside, but Hamilton effectively bodied Stanton out the road and went, nah, it's mine, um, and was offside, but then lobbed it over the, lobbed it over the bar. Can it's, I just it's probably one your big striker, thing. didn't it? I, for me, one of the things that made us more secure yesterday when we went 2 nothing up was Ross Matthews' performance. I it thought was 100%. Ross, Ross showed everything that he, he's about. I thought he was... I thought he was really good challenging and winning balls where he needed to, but his positional sense was so good as well and just his experience that we needed at that time. And it, yeah, it was so great a, to see the him difference, start. I was just going to say the difference from the Arbroath game, because I mean, I, I'll be open and say that I was I was critical on here of him because, and not, not I've, critical of him as much as the the decision to keep him in there, like it, he wasn't the player we needed at that point, but yesterday he was absolutely the player that we needed in that game, see, especially I, when you've got Hamilton and Otu. I never, I never really saw Rossi's performance last week being as bad as you made it out to be. I thought in the first half he had a, he 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 played very well. I think he, he in the second half where everybody was having a bad time. And everything was going to, to pot sort of thing. He was like everybody. There was he was sort of faded out of the game. That, See, was the, and, the, I agree with you, John. I, and and I, I mean, we said this in the in the yeah. post match. I thought um, I was I was I was maybe less enthused than, than others about Ross Matthews coming back. Just thought he's been away a long time, and you know, look at the other quality of the other midfielders that we've got, and. I wonder how long it'll take him to get back up to speed. And I was really impressed from the Arbroath game. And and obviously I've, I've got eyes, so I was really impressed with him um, yesterday as well. I thought he was absolutely brilliant. And any kind of concerns I had about is it going to take him time or any of that kind of stuff was absolutely and rightly thrown back in my face. I thought he was he was absolutely brilliant. 
Um, I think I think with the games that we've got coming up, he could be a, a really crucial player for us. You know, I just think he's he's got that bit of dig about him. I did speak to Lewis Vaughan about him, and he said <laughs> he was laughing when he he almost challenged himself into scoring a goal last week. It wasn't a shot at goals, it was a challenge against the boy <laughs> that kind of spun out and over the bar. But, you know, Rossi's experience and strength yeah. will be quite valuable now for now on in. And that was the, Speaks the point really I was well, Ross Matthews as well. He does. He's Sorry, a, a, a very educated young man, actually, to be fair. He's a, he's a rarity um, in the footballing world. He's a bright lad. Um, yeah. He, um, for me, the th- the point I was making last week was actually the it's the exactly what was great about him yesterday is you you know what you're getting from Ross Matthews like he's not he's not the 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 Sean Byrne type of midfielder he's not that kind of cultured slow the game down move the ball on and that's what I felt the game needed last week when when things were going to pot. Um, I, I feel like he's a, a can of gasoline and like the, the, it had caught fire last week and we just kept pouring on top of it. Do you know what I mean? It just kept getting worse. Whereas yesterday, and, and to be fair, the, the, the substitutions, and I know we've mentioned already, but when you, the, the auto substitution, the, the summer substitution, the, the, the changes, and you look at the changes we made in that game, I mean, the the two centre midfielders for Dunfermline yesterday were Otto and Hamilton. Hamilton was on a booking from half an hour in, and Otto mm-hmm. wasn't. Like, I, I genuinely cannot get my head around that substitution. It, 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 that was the moment for me when the game turned. I actually tweeted the Rovers um, 10 minutes before the final whistle, um, saying that I was looking forward to seeing the poster. Um Genuinely, I did because it was, and it's the first time I can remember this season with ten minutes to go, where I had no doubt we were winning that game. Absolutely none. It's um, I don't know. I can't think off the top of my head of all the derbies that we've had this season. Um, it's certainly the five that we've won. If you and Otto hasn't been the best player on the other side, mm-hmm. and more or less all of them. All of them, and he's he's played in defence and he's played in midfield, and I've been really mm-hmm. impressed with him. And as I said already, I was I was delighted to, to see him go off. I don't think it was necessarily it wasn't like he's, he's no Superman. He wasn't going to turn that game around single handedly. No. But I think he was their best chance of of staying in that game actually uh, at the point that he went off. And I think that the only only single one in their squad that I would take when I wouldn't touch any of them. I would take him. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 He's, he's, he's just a he's just a solid championship player. I think what you're saying about it, it came across very clearly how fired up Chris Hamilton was and how angry what an angry wee man he is. Yes. I must if I looked at him, it'd be like looking in the mirror. <laughs> John, I think you do yourself a disservice there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Waiting for somebody to say it. Um, right, I think we've we've got one one kind of final incident of the game to to cover, and then we'll pick up some uh, some stray thoughts because I've got a few more that I'd like to to discuss. I've not um, even mentioned Tuesday Alex, yet, um, and then we'll we'll talk about Tuesday as well. Um, so we did win a penalty, uh, more or less the the last kick of the ball. Um, John, I'll come to you first because obviously you were in the in the stand, which is probably the better angle to see this. Were you were you leaping off your seat, screaming up and down for a penalty there? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest, I was quite surprised that Marty McFly's dad gave it. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased Les reminded me that's what I called them. But I was, I was it, it all seemed to happen in slow motion. You had Sam, you had a, a boy leaning on him, and he went down, and then it seemed to take an age, and then it, it was like Marty McFly's dad just stood there, and he th- thought about it, and then he went, oh, yes, and he gave that it, is... and then he moved. It was it's, so um... strange. Yeah, so I think I think the boy steps on Stanton's heel. 
I think is that is actually what happens. It's not really like a trip or anything. I think he just kind of catches him. It's completely accidental. Probably, I mean, I think it is a foul if that is what happened. Um, I think it's the kind of one that a lot of referees don't bother giving, especially in the last minute, especially in a game that's had more than a couple of goals. Uh, there's, you know, there's a, a two goal gap, um, particularly when that is the team that's winning already. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is not what happened. But I did just wonder if there's a little part of his in his head where he was like, "Remember when you were feigning injury out there?" <laughs> Penalty kick, just because there was there was enough of a delay for him to have a little conscious thought of like, "Then he do that again." Um, and then uh, Callum Smith t- steps up for the penalty. I mean, it's it's towards the bottom corner. There's not a lot of power on it. Um, uh, Denise Mehmet saves a penalty. I don't know. Earns himself another two and a half Denise? years on his contract. Did you call him Denise deliberately there? <laughs> that's, that's his name. Denise Mehmet. Yeah, my, my, my Turkish pronunciations are possibly less than <laughs> perfect, to be fair. Um, but I don't think I don't think they're cutting about an anchor calling him Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> um any 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 particular thoughts on the on the penalty? Anything you want to it was just Add weird. It was just weird because it was like it was so late in the game that it was of no consequence whatsoever. Like it wasn't as if it had been, say, three minutes to go, they save it, they suddenly get fired up and they run down the end and score one, and then suddenly it's a game. It wasn't as if, like, well, we you know, we get a goal and then that's it, it's all over. It was like the cigars were already out. It was just it was effectively no matter what happened, it was the last kick of the ball. And it was just a weird, like, non event of a penalty. Um, yeah, very, very odd. It's um, yeah, I was a little bit surprised that Callum Smith was the one who took it. More, more so, kind of because of what you've just said, that it almost like normal rules don't apply. Like you could have given it to like a Ross Matthews or a Sam Stanton, but I mean, it's it's not it's not it's not a case of there like were, there were people behind us calling for Kevin to come down and take it. <laughs> It's one of them. It's so late in the game that the honest truth is nobody cares. But it's a right good giggle, though. And actually, even the fact that that Mehmet saved it k- kind of was quite humorous. Like, where, exactly. where were you? Where were you for the rest of the game, mate? Like, because you've shipped goals all season for us, and now right. you step up in the ninety-sixth minute. Still manages to palm it out in the danger area as well. He does. I mean, he gets though. away with it in the end. But it's like, I mean, come on, son, learn a lesson. Yeah. Um, so that that brings us to the to the end of the game. Um, so first of all, I would just like to take a second to discuss our old <laughs> friend Alex Jakubiak. Uh, uh, childish Blair, come on, childish. Um, Sorry, childish. But because I was thinking this, he, he, Alex Jakubiak, he's, he's like a cardboard cutout of a tiger. Like he <laughs> looks really dangerous and is mm. ultimately completely harmless. Like just <laughs> does it's nothing a great analogy. ever. Like the even like you know, like kind of five ten minutes at the game, you think oh, this guy's movement's pretty decent, and uh, you know um, he's got a bit of physicality about him, and you know it's like oh, he's a little bit of link up play there, and uh, <laughs> then you see him shoot, and you're like, oh right, ah, it's fine. <laughs> nah, I didn't want to it. It's just Alex Jakubiak. Uh, I'm actually tempted to go back and watch the highlights of that those two goals he scored against the United just to find out exactly how that happened. <laughs> like he's just like, and I know we we devoted about a third of the preview talking about Chris Kane, who could very well be out for the rest of the season. Which obviously that's a shame for him. I'm not laughing at that, but like when your your striking Sorry, options are <laughs> Alex Jakubiak and Craig Whiten, who is worse, like. <laughs> Of course, you're whatever they are in the division now, but they're a point off the relegation playoffs or whatever. Um, like, just you will not see a more ineffective performance from someone who's like effectively a lone striker. Um, and it's the fact he's just been doing that all year that is very, very funny, to be fair. And, I was really um, impressed with the way we dealt with it, though, because. I do still think he's the kind of player who could get a bit of joy if you crap yourself. 
because he's a big, like you say, he's a big boy. He's a big physical player, and he pits his cell about. And if you let yourself get bullied, like he's the kind of boy that could bully you. There was a moment I don't actually think it made the highlights, but I, um, I messaged the group chat when it had happened, and it was the one down in the bottom corner in oh. front of the railway stand, where he he wipe he effectively ended up wiping out James Brown into Kev, um, chasing it down. And because you're watching it on the TV, you can see Jakubiak's winning that ball. He's getting there before Kev. And James Brown, just really smart defending, just slows down, cuts across him, takes the hit, and gets kind of wiped out. And, and it's just Jakubiak all over. He's like, he, do you know what? He actually reminds me a little bit of um, Katongo. A very similar kind of striker. Big, strong, fast, pish. You can see why he gets contracts and you can see why like you would be tempted to take him on if your striking options aren't great. But what you need is somebody who can actually score goals. Somebody who will feed off him. And uh, you need that somebody to not be Craig Whiten. <laughs> it's probably the main thing. <laughs> One thing I will um, say about Jakubiak is it's almost like there's that cliche, which is that if you've got pace and strength, you can always cause trouble, which I always used to think mm. was true. Until I think there was a three month window in last season where Willie Accio and then before, oh, around the same time John Fredrickson also took out the cliche if you've got height, you can always close trouble. So, yeah. since the middle of last season, I've never believed those things anymore. And I think that's true yeah. with Jakubiak as well. You know, he is, he's a big, strong lad, but there's no end product there. No. Yeah, I think it um, becomes abundantly clear why he was all too keen to talk about anything other than the football. In his pre-match, just not not good enough. Uh, to be perfectly yeah. honest, and the um, one as well. At the end of the game, that <laughs> Zach Rudden and and him were in a great conversation. Obviously, they played together, and oh, I was yeah. just looking at it, thinking Zach's gone over and gone. You're still shite, then, aren't you? <laughs> just simple as that, you know. Zach didn't even put his hand over his mouth like players do these days. He just went, you're still shy, aren't you? <laughs> just, I mean, you, you can tell they've not had a lot of fun watching that all season. Um, Blair, you were you were asking for the poster 10 minutes before full time. Were you um, pleased when you saw it? Or did you, did you also you? find that childish? Oh, I did. And I am 100% here for it. Yeah, I did. Um, 49 minutes past four, um, I tweeted, um, can he wait to see the poster? Um, and oh, it was worth waiting for. And it was just... Oh. And actually, I love the I love the hidden shithousery of our posters. So, like, the, the one about us catching Dundee United, but the Jakubiak go-kart is blowing up in the background. You know those the little bits that you miss on the first time of viewing? The fact that it's two Dundee loanies that are the Giants, that's got to be a wee... A wee two, uh, two Dundee loanies that, by all accounts, James McPake was desperate to pack oh, yeah. up. Yep. 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 Brilliant. Which I think was almost certainly the uh, yeah. the, the, the barb <laughs> hidden in that. It was, it was brilliant. And, uh, yeah, we note for uh, Dylan Easton sliding into Sunday as well, which made me yeah, laugh Yeah, that this was morning. good. Very good. It's just, and also, um, just a wee, I know we're not really here to do the whole childish thing, but since the club's going to do it, I think we should maybe join in. Um, so the PARs apparently have a podcast um, called um, That's Never Ten Yards. Um, and I say apparently because I think they've done three podcasts in the last six years or something. And it seems to be just one guy who claims he doesn't really care about the Rovers, yet has a podcast named after a line from a game when they beat Wraith Rovers. And put out a tweet um, after they beat uh, Partick Thistle. A lot. I'm not even going to read it, but paraphrasing along the lines of "We've managed to do something that Wraith Rovers haven't done all season, which is win a game by more than one goal." Oh, the beauty that the one game we win by more than one goal was against them as well. It was like the the Twitter gods just saying, "Get it, Runge." It was beautiful. Yeah, and the, the, the guy himself, I've seen him, he's kind of, kind of, the, the classic thing where he's like, ha ha, that was the, that was the joke all along. And it's like <laughs> yeah. the kind of classic, uh, 
meme of the the guy who's kind of wet himself and everybody's laughing at him and there's a little thought bubble that just says ha rent free <laughs> rent free like, well done you've you've bared your ass to the entire world and uh, apparently done it deliberately so <laughs> congratulations <laughs> well done uh yeah. enjoy your no points from derbies um <laughs> Let's get by. Well, let's let's we'll, we'll dig ourselves out of the uh, childish trenches for a second. Um, <sighs> I've already said. I, I think by far and away, I thought Sam Stanton was the the man of the match. Um, John, you've obviously rightly mentioned uh, kind of Ross Matthews there as well. Mm-hmm. Anybody else we want to kind of really single out for um, for some praise after that one? Hi, you and Murray. I want to you say something Murray. about you and Murray. Yeah. So we talked about John Hughes wanting somebody to take one in the dish. Ewan did that right in the first half. He took one right in the coupon, mm-hmm. a shot right in the coupon went down. And, I mean, to be honest, there's probably not many teams in the division that are less dangerous than Dunfermline. Nonetheless, you know, we dealt with... We had, we had, they had quite a lot of corners, and we dealt with them all. And, you know, I hope now that Murray's maybe kind of stepping up and kind of taking leadership, realising he's probably going to be the main defender between now and the majority of the end of the season. So, yeah, a, a word as well for, for you and Murray for taking one in the dish and for, for boosting our, our return to defend and set plays. And I think that's yeah. really important because Scott Fleming was on Sports Sound as the Rovers phone-in fan. If we'd conceded from a cross ball, that would not have been good for anybody. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, BBC Scotland producers and their bleep button might have been uh, called <laughs> called into duty there. Um, Scott spoke very well on the radio oh, he did, uh, he did. yesterday. He did. Um, with his Dundee United pal, uh, who kind of failed to answer the questions given to him. But um, <laughs> I think the the actually the whole defence deserves a lot of credit because um, yeah. as much as anybody, obviously we've been we've been fairly vocal about like organisationally when Scott Brown's in there. There's maybe been some some kind of gaps and, and maybe not doing exactly what you would want. Yesterday, there was absolutely none of that at all. I don't think across the entire 90 minutes, I don't think they were turned once. I can't really think of them being running behind. Um, and yeah, just, just really did kind of handle everything that was that was thrown at them um, very well indeed. As you would expect in, um, in a derby, I thought Lewis Vaughan was excellent as well. Mm-hmm. Again, probably not the type of game he would necessarily kind of pick for himself you know he didn't have a lot of the ball at his feet he didn't get a lot of kind of shots at goal but his involvement and everything um was exactly what you what you would want what you would need from that um mention for james brown as well he is probably the most vanilla right back you're going to get do you know what i mean he, he's not going to stand out but um and and i don't I actually don't think he's the answer long term. I don't think we're going to be rushing out to to snap him up um, on a long term contract. Um, but I've I've been quite pleased with him since he's come in, mm. and again he he adds to that stability, that that kind of shoring up at the back. He is he is our right footed Liam Dick, um, and he he does it well. It's like not necessarily the right back that you want, but very much the right back that we need. Yes, at the moment. He's kind of come in and done exactly what we've needed, and he said it himself in his interview that like I want to defend first and foremost, and he's been completely yeah. true to that. But yeah, yeah, I've been I've been really quite impressed with him. I think he's done exactly what we've we've needed. Um, so let's um, move along then, and just quickly cover off Tuesday night. Um, so the Rovers going to Fur Hill to play Partick Thistle. Uh, this will be intriguing. Partick Thistle seem to have become one of these weird teams who are just very, very difficult to pin down. So they still have the capability to really play quite well, but just can't seem to actually get any results. And sometimes kind of in, in really quite wild circumstances. I don't know if any of you saw them playing against Dunfermline a couple of weeks back. They had like two goals disallowed and were doing really well and still somehow got beat 3-1. I think they, their last seven league games, they've drawn five and lost the other two, um, which is the worst form in the division, I think. But, I mean, there's not a chance you're telling me Partick Thistle are the worst side in the division like on any day at all. Um, but it was like my mate had said yesterday when we were watching the game, like Thistle, if you check the score 
on any given Saturday and Thistle were three 0 up, you'd be like, "Yeah, that checks out." And equally, if you checked and they were three 0 down, you'd be like, "Yeah, that makes sense." And at the time he said that they were two down to Queens Park, and obviously they came back and drew two each. So it's very difficult to know um, kind of what to make of Partick Thistle at the moment. Um, but Leslie, coming to you from a Rovers point of view, going into this one, um, I think we'll almost certainly see. Josh Mullen drop out. Sounds like he's got a kind of a rib issue um, from Ian Murray's interview. But is there anyone in particular you would like to see come in and, and anybody else you think might drop out of that starting 11? I don't know. I mean, I suppose one one thing is if you look at this fixture, if we'd had this a month ago or something, we'd actually probably be thinking we need to not lose this because you'd be looking a wee bit at the gap back to third. I think the gap's opened up enough now over the last few games that we can go into this one and say, you know, we need to go for it and try and win it because realistically the gap is so big, it is very, very unlikely that Partick can over, overhaul us for a second. I suppose what a couple of questions are, does Sean Byrne come back in for Ross Matthews? Um, I suspect we start with Zach Rudden up top again. I think we'll probably see Connolly coming in for, for, uh, for Mullen. Um, other than that, I wouldn't, want to see us change too much. I don't think there's actually much more we can change unless Keith Watson is back. And if he's not 100%, I wouldn't be risking him. With Ross Matthews being available now, proving he can do a full 90 and do it well, there's not the need to have Brown back in the midfield that there might have been. So I, I wouldn't expect to see huge changes beyond maybe Mullen coming out and the possibility of Byrne coming back in. That's very, very similar, actually, to the way that I've looked at this. I think you're right. I think assuming Keith Watson's not fully fit, um, I think it's the same back four. When I've looked at it, I've kind of gone on the balance, actually keeping Matthews in for Sean Burns. It seems like Sean Burns maybe had a, a wee bit of a fitness issue as well. And then, yeah, Connolly in for, for Mullen. I wonder if Jack Hamilton might come in for Zach Rudden, just purely on the basis of minutes played recently yeah. and the amount of effort that Zach Rudden puts in I mean you can see he's absolutely empty in the tank every time you play him um, so I wonder if we might not see a swap there. Um, John what about you? Um, looking forward to this one and uh, any kind of changes you, you yeah, expect to see? I, I'm looking forward to it the, as we all know Parrick Thistle can be a very good uh, team on their day with a very nice smelling manager as we've been told <laughs> Um, I think it'll be a difficult, a difficult game, but I, I, um, along the same lines as you boys, I would, I would, I would change too much about the team. I think Connolly for Mullen would be the, the, the one that would probably stand out. Um, but yeah, it's one that I, I would go there with a bit of confidence that we could go there and, and, and win. At least they're a footballing team. So we know that we're going to be in a game. Uh, they're not going to sit back for us. They're, I think they'll come and have a go at us, and that might suit us as well. I think um, we're in the Jackie husband stand for this one, which, I, if, I, if I'm getting my Fur Hill geography correct, is not the kind of main stand. Um, we're on the other side, um, which feels like a kind of positive omen. Um, when I think of being in that stand across, I think of that uh, Challenge Cup semi-final Rams with Cup, um, yeah. Regan Hendry. Um, Phoenix Academy Wafer Cup, I should say. Yeah. Valentine's Day, I think. Um, for the I, last I game like before COVID. Been, yeah. I think possibly the, the very last game. Um, mm. Whereas when I think of being in that main stand, I think of that fog game, uh, which <laughs> was, was unenjoyable. Um so hopefully, I'd say that's a, a kind of positive sign. Um, Blair, just give me your uh, give me your thoughts going into this one as well, please. Yeah, I'd echo pretty much everything that's been said. Nothing major to add. I, th I think um, I think I would have burn in over Matthews um, for the reason that I think there, I think it will be more of a football match than a than a kind of a needing Matthews to go around and and kind of pour gasoline on things. Um, so I'd like to see him back in. I think I'd like to see Hamilton play. Um, I feel a bit sorry for Hamilton, actually. I have to say, he's done absolutely nothing wrong. 
And just at the moment, can he really get a sniff? But it's credit to Rudden. He's come in and he's taken his position and he's done a really good job at it. Um, and then, yeah, Connolly for Mullen would probably be the other one for me as well. Um, I'd like to see us go at them, actually. I really would. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I was like a, a wee trip to Farhill. Farhill for Farhills. Looking forward to it. I, I am too. I think it should be... Um... It should be a good one to, to kind of go into. I've got no no anxieties about it, like we maybe have about kind of other games over the last few months. I think this should be a really good game between two kind of decent sides. And uh, yeah, hopefully we um, come out on top. Uh, so I've got a couple other things just to, to kind of cover off on this one. Um, first of all, we will um, definitely hear more from Carol Allison Smith next time that she's on the pod. Uh, I think we're all kind of keen to hear about her first trip back to Stark Park in four years. But just um, after yesterday, she'd asked us to, to kind of pass along her thanks to absolutely everybody who played a part in the various kind of International Women's Day events yesterday. Um, and to be fair, I think it's also worth saying, you know, Carol played a huge part in that as well. Um, doing a lot of the organising from Barcelona, but uh, by all accounts, they would have you know, a resounding success, you know, across the board. Loads of work went into that. So, you know, on behalf of Carol and and well, everybody else, you know, thank you to everybody who was involved in that. Um, John, you'd said to us previously, you'd obviously mentioned um, Ern and Jess, husband. Uh, no, sorry, um, is it Beth? John, we talked about this beforehand, and I've got their <laughs> names mixed up. Yes, Erin and Jess. Right? It is Erin and Jess. Erin and Jess, husband, yeah. Now, they were the two girls who are, are playing for, they both were on the bench for Hearts uh, ladies team today as they beat Parrick Thistle, Brian Graham's Parrick Thistle, 1-0 to progress to the semi-final of the Scottish Cup. They're 15-year-old twins from Kirkcaldy. They started playing their football as part of the as four year olds in the Wraith Rovers Community Foundation. So they progressed through that pathway and then were scouted and went to to Harks. They came yesterday, they um they did a tour of the ground, um, they got their pictures taken in the dress rooms, then they came to hospitality, they spoke brilliantly at hospitality. Davy Hancock then had them along doing their commentary for the first half. So they shared uh, the co-commentary with Davy Hancock for the first half. Then they came on the pitch with Doc Wilson and they did the the um, halftime draw. They were just an absolute credit to their parents, but credit to Wraith Rovers Community Foundation as well and a credit to Kirkcaldy. It was, I, I'd read about them and I said to them, get them along. Um, and get them a bit of recognition for the home crowd. Tomorrow is 15-year-old girls. You'll not like to hear this player, but they're off school tomorrow because they're away with the Scotland, Scotland under-18 team to Poland to play in the Euro qualifiers. So they're in I the squad that. for that. Um, and, and one of their teammates in that squad is Jock McStay's daughter, Olivia, which is great because... Everybody when we go golfing slags Jock and says, at least your daughter made it as an international player, Jock. <laughs> there you go. So an, an absolute credit to to everybody in Kirkcaldy. Brilliant. And I, I think there are two girls that will have a chance, you know. I wouldn't be surprised if they're playing for Arsenal or somebody quite soon. I did introduce them to Carol and say, look, if you sign for Barcelona... You'll get digs over there for a wee while, if you like cats, anyway. <laughs> so, absolutely. Right. Good luck to them over in uh, in Poland for these games. And um, the other thing I've got here is, is I believe, what uh, in the fashion world they call a collab, uh, is uh, <laughs> Blair and Leslie got together earlier today for uh, another addition to the uh, ever-increasing merchandise catalogue. Um, Blair, I'll come to you. You can uh, you can give us a a sneak preview or a a, a sales pitch for this. <laughs> yeah, so um, it felt about time um that we had some Sam Stanton merch um up on the up on the the Etsy shop. Um, so I I um, contacted Les last night, who did an express job um on a on a wee Sam Stanton uh, image for us, 
Um, so there's a couple of t-shirts, um, and because Carol asked for one, there's a vest top. So if anybody in you know <laughs> LinkedIn or or up the Galton needs a needs a vest top, um, there is a vest top. For some reason, which I can't quite figure out, is more expensive than the t-shirt. I think it's just because they don't sell very many of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're going to kind of expand the range a little bit. We're going to do some um, hoodies and some jumpers and stuff as well with with the same stuff on them. But it's um, so there's two. There's one which is just Sam Stanton doing his um, celebration, which is the the sort of love heart with his hands. Um, and then there's the um, the seventy percent of the earth is covered by water, and the other thirty percent is covered by Sam Stanton. There's a wee pie chart on there just because I'm a science teacher and I couldn't help myself. Um, so there's a mug um, if you if you feel that way inclined um, and a t-shirt. And like I say, the next day or two, I'll get um, hoodies and um, sweatshirts up as well. But it's just to say as well, if anybody kind of is, I'm not going to say suggest what, what logos you want on them, but if anybody's looking for any of that stuff on something different, um, feel free to give us a shout. I can't promise that, that. I mean, it's a, it's not an unlimited range of things that you can print onto. Um, but it was actually Les that had said about um, getting a, a sweatshirt rather than a rather than a hoodie. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll try and get a couple of those up and stuff as well. But um, I I personally I think it's the best. It's the best icon image picture. What I don't know what you want to call it that Les has done yet. The one of Sam Stanton it is. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It, it, is, it really is brilliant. You'll see it um, and you will be suitably impressed, I'm sure. Um, so the link for that, if you have been enticed by that um, wonderful piece of guerrilla marketing, uh, is in the show notes <laughs> alongside the yes. um, the usual stuff, the Twitter and the, and the Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Do us a favour, folks. If you are going to it, go via that link. Don't Google it. Don't go and search for it because there is... There's a link which is basically just oh no 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 podcast dot etsy dot com, so it's really simple. But if you use that, we save on the fees, so we actually don't pay as much um, Etsy fees if you use that specific link. If you use any other link, Etsy take more of our money basically. Yeah, and uh, minutes before we started recording, my microphone literally fell apart, so there uh, <laughs> there could be need for additional funds uh, in the very near future. Um, Right, thank you once again, uh, sincerely, everyone for uh, for listening and for watching. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree it's been a it's been a delight kind of watching and, and talking about this Rovers team, and it's a delight to have you kind of listening in with us too. Uh, so we will see you on Tuesday night in Mary Hill, and we'll be back in the aftermath of that for our usual kind of debrief, and then look ahead to a second successive uh, trip into Glasgow as we look a f- look forward to uh, a weekend's trip to Hamden too. So thank you again and goodbye. Goodbye.